Someone tweeted me, hey, Mark, is it true the song Every Morning is about pegging? You know, or like pegging or a used condom or something. So I go, finally, someone, someone speaks the obvious truth. Okay, everybody, this is a special one. I am joined by my best friend, Mark McGrath. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. What is up, best friend? BFF. What's up? You know what I have on my so desk? Good. What's that? This is this is us. Ooh. A little Remember polo. that? That was so fun. A little nineties trivia we went through on, on your show. That was so much fun. Was... And it was fun, Ash, because you and I have gotten closer just on social media and stuff. So it's really fun to you know, you always say, oh, let's let's stay in, you know, contact or whatever, but you never do. But you and I have managed to do that. So I'm super grateful for your friendship and for having me on. It's amazing. You know who I interviewed on Friday who told me to tell you that he says hello is Mr. Ethan Hawk. Oh, my, that's insane. And I want to tell you why it's insane. I forever, as you know, have been compared to Ethan Hawk. Now those that are watching are saying, no way. Now in the 90s and probably about the early 2000s before I put on like 25 pounds, I looked like Ethan Hawk. I used to have the Rowdy Bites hairdo. I wore these sort of like dentist chair shirts. I wanted to be Ethan Hawke's character in Reality Bites. That's what I wanted to do. And forever people have compared us. And there was one TMZ uh, episode where a guy was running down the street after Ethan and going, Mark, Mark. And he turned around, it's Ethan Hawke. And they did a whole thing on it in TMZ. Uh, and I always thought he was kind of annoyed by it. I've never really heard from him, his perspective. So for him to say hello to me, I am honored, Ash. <laughs> I think he, he, he loves it. Um, Did you talk about it at all? I, I, I always say this because I've never heard a peep out of him at all about the Mark McGrath, uh, Ethan Hawke thing. And in fact, I will tell you this, when I went to Extra for the first time in 2004, there was a big rollout there and our executive producer who, actually got me to work at Extra, Lisa G, a legend in the business, um, was good friends with Katie Couric. And Katie Couric had Ethan on the Today Show. And they're talking about Ethan's book he has coming out and the, the theater he's putting on and all these wonderful, intelligent, incredible uh, things he's doing. And then at the end of the morning, it's, it's in the morning, so it's kind of low energy, you know what I mean? Like cool, cool interview. At the end, she goes, Ethan, I just got to tell you, and all of a sudden behind him, there's a split screen of me and him. And she goes, has anybody ever told you you look like Mark McGrath? And he goes, yeah, they've told me that. Like, kind of like resigned to it. Like, yeah, it's a bummer. But And it, there was no fun in it at all. And I felt so bad because I love Ethan Hawke. I'm a big fan of, uh, of him. Uh, and so I was just bummed out that if that ever bummed him out, because I, I get it a lot in my, at least I used to back in the day, that I used to sign autographs as Ethan Hawke because I didn't want people to think he was mean. Because at first I'd say, no, I'm not him. They go, oh, come on, man. You know, I, I see you trying to be low key. I'm not going to bother you. So I ended up signing uh, autographs. So I know he's probably got a little bit of that in his own. So I'm glad to hear that it that it doesn't bother him or he has a sense of humor about it. Oh, I mean, he was, I was like, oh, I'm interviewing your like 90s brother, Mark McGrath. And he was like, oh, tell him I said hi. <laughs> Oh, good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that, man, because uh, like I said, I'm a fan and good guy, man. So I apologize to him for years of uh, of torture, but, you know, he's still in shape and looks great. And I've gone up to pass her. So that's not right. true. Stop <laughs> saying that. <laughs> Come on. It's, it's, I live and die by that. Uh, so uh, you were doing this Vice documentary called The Dark Side of the 90s, um, which explores what else? You are our 90s like doula explores everything about the 90s. <laughs> The, when you hear the 90s, just what flashes through your head? I feel like you spend every day thinking about the 90s. Well, I mean, I got to say the 90s are really, really good to me. You know, all my dreams came true in the 90s and, and dreams beyond my wildest expectations. And I had some pretty wild dreams, you know, growing up. Uh, so it was a real sweet spot for me. And, and I'm honored to sort of be the doula, if you will. That's a great, great, uh, or the ambassador of the 90s. And I, I'm grateful for it. A lot of bands or, or a lot of people don't want to be associated with the 90s because I think they feel it's a bit of nostalgia. And nostalgia, for some reason, in the music business, is considered bad by the artist for some reason. I look at the word nostalgia in the dictionary. It's, it means remembering the best times of your life sharing times with others, wishing to go back to a more innocent place. It's all these wonderful descriptions. So I think in the music business, we look at nostalgia as the kiss of death, meaning your career is older, be over. Because 
it, nostalgia in sports is something we all revere. Even the athletes go, oh yeah, back in the day, and we celebrate the nostalgia. But in music, you can watch us grow old. So nostalgia almost makes us remind us of a time maybe when we were better, younger, uh, we were relevant. So I understand people being uh, hesitant to really embrace that. But for me, I am honored to have affected a few people. They remember the times, they remember the music, they remember where they were. So I, I dig into it. I lean into the nostalgia of the 90s because I'm so grateful to be a part of it in the first place. And as far as the 90s as a decade, it was last time we all, meaning all of us, shared a communal experience on receiving music, receiving uh, TV shows, receiving uh, books that came out. And I say this because you know, TV shows were on at nine o'clock on Thursday night and NBC. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all sat around and watched it. We had, it was a communal experience. Uh, records came out on Tuesday and we all got them on Tuesday. The MT MTV would uh, debut a video on that Friday. And we all watched it collectively. Now we didn't have social media then, so it wasn't in real time, but we all experienced it in real time. And we will never do that again. So I think that's why the nostalgia of the 90s, everybody's yearning for the 90s will always be uh, in existence. Now that's the good part of the 90s. Now there was a dark side of the 90s because I lived it, I was there, and I've been fortunate enough to host the dark side of the 90s now on Vice. And when you think about, you know, tabloid TV, you think about the Viper Room, an episode we did last year where I met my wife at the Viper Room. So that was so strange doing the deep dive into that one and, and narrating that one. Um, you know, the UFC's rise this year in the 90s, there have been so many, you know, just incredible stories of the 90s and revisiting them through my eyes in the dark side of the 90s has been incredible. Uh, I think we look back on all decades with rose tinted sunglasses, but dark side of the 90s really does an expert professional way of doing the deep dive on all these uh, these topics that people care about. And we did Dark Side 90s one and people wanted more and we're happy to deliver it, Ash. It's coming back strong. One thing you were mentioning, you were talking about how you kind of embrace the nostalgia of the 90s. And one thing I really love about you is Sometimes, you know, you go see a band and you get the sense of like, once they play the hit they're it's like, they're kind of like reluctant to do it. I, the first time I ever saw you, it was just like the energy that emulates off you is so like, I, I just, it was just, I remember me and my friend being like, Mark McGrath is the coolest person in the world because you just <laughs> wanted to be in your presence. And it was so contagious how happy you were. And we were just like, oh my God, we love, that's what, that's what we got like really obsessed with Mark McGrath and Sugar Ray again. Well, I mean, that's a huge compliment, Ash. You know, all I want to do as a performer is emote that kind of energy, you know, because I'm having the best time ever. It's never false. I don't care if there's three people out there or a thousand. You can't fake that energy. You can't fake that joy. And I say this because I don't know where it comes from. You know, I don't walk around all day being that joyful and happy. You know, I live life like everybody else and I, I try and be as positive as I can, but life beats you down. Life is hard. But on stage, when I get out there, there's this magic that just, just exists on stage. And I'm so proud to be part of that lightning in a bottle moment. And I want to share it with the audience. You know, I was lucky enough to somehow find my way to some kind of medium success in the music business. And it was, it was incredible. The entire ride was amazing. So I look back nostalgically as well. So if I can at all, you know, give people a moment of joy while they're watching Sugar A or you enjoy the songs, I'm going to do it. I love these songs and I, 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 I bow at the feet of these songs so people like them a little bit. You're going to hear them delivered by me with all the zest and vigor as if the first time we ever played them, you know, that's and true. I believe that's your responsibility. For me, when you look at this like, oh, let's get this hit song out of the way. Wait till you hear our new stuff. Let me tell you something. I don't want to hear your new stuff either. I don't want to hear Sugar Ray's new stuff. You know what I mean? I want to hear the hits. Uh, and that's something that luckily I don't feel I'm selling out by because I've always loved that part of show business and the celebration and the pomp and circumstance of it all. So it's something that uh, I, I find I, I find not naturally in my day to day life. But once I get on stage, it's easy to emote that because I'm so grateful to be there. But thank you, Ash. It's a wonderful compliment. You say medium success like Sugar Ray doesn't have like so many hits. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but whenever someone's like, oh, like fly and this, I'm like, no, 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 no. And I just start rattling off like six or seven hits that I love so much. Well, you know me, Ash, I'm very self-effacing, but when you have two number ones, four top tens, and six top forties, and you sold 10 million records around the world, a little bit of a humble brag, if you will, you know? That's and right. that's the good news. Like, no matter what you think about us or whatever, you can never take away, we had two number one songs. You can't take that away. You can try, but you can't rewrite history. You can call me whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can don't, not like the band, but the people have spoken, and those, every morning and fly got the number one. Someday got the number three. When it's over, got the number eight, you know? So that, those are some pretty impressive stats 
And like I said, I'm the first guy to make fun of me, first guy to make fun of the band, but I'm very proud of our accomplishments. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, one thing you were mentioning is, you know, the kind of the appointment viewing that we used to have. We didn't really have the internet the way uh, that we do now. And I think what's so interesting is just kind of rising to fame in the 90s. You kind of had to pick and choose your battles of like what rumors you were going to shoot down. And like you had to have like somebody make a statement. You couldn't just go on Twitter and be like, nah, not true. So I'm curious what the wildest headlines that you saw about yourself were. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of crazy ones back back in the day, like someone said I had a, a baby in Germany, but they would go away just as quickly because for some reason now, someone validates a tweet from an anonymous uh, account in Des Moines, Iowa with one followers, and that thing is gospel. It's like Time Magazine put it out, and I don't know why all of a sudden journalism, if you want to call it that, or accusations or rumors have become just locked down, you know, uh, biblical, if you want. That is the absolute truth without any sort of validation or any way even to document or validate the truth. So that's been kind of interesting to me. I think it's been more difficult today to combat rumors than it was back then, you know, because people, because rumors would get to a certain point, they'd come to your camp and you'd be like, that's ridiculous. And they, they wouldn't even see the light of day. I mean, 90% of them never saw the light of day. I mean, there's always the one that was dating Madonna. And I got to say, I perpetuated that one forever because that was a <laughs> freaking cool rumor. You know what I mean? I was not, I was real coy about that one. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? We've talked before. I mean, I, I let that breathe a long time until the truth came out to that one. But the funny thing is now, Ash, there's, there's, a, there's a rumor now, and it's not even a rumor because people believe it as true. And I've, I've even said this is absolutely false this did not happen this is not how it goes down i was there i co-wrote the song people believe the halo and every morning is a used condom oh my gosh this, Mark. This is, yeah Go we, debunked, we talked about this because i said this to you and you were like what and we debunked it and now it's back up this rumor is coming back around it will not go away <laughs> well it, it got a whole new life again on TikTok. and the funniest thing me being the moron I am, I perpetuated the rumor again because about 10 years ago, someone uh, someone tweeted me, hey, Mark, is it true the song every morning is about pegging, you know, or, or like pegging or, or use condom or something. So I go, finally, someone someone speaks the obvious truth. Right? I, I, and I, it was a joke. <laughs> and then people are so irony has been lost in the social media age. And that's something yeah. I lead with in humor. I mean, I just think it's so obvious that, it, you know what I mean? So for 15 years, that song existed and we promoted the hell of that song around the world. Never mentioned this whatever condom or pegging thing people are going deep diving with now. Never <laughs> once. And all of a sudden now, in the last 10 years, now that's true. So it's just so ridiculous. It's so, and it comes a point in time where you can't even combat the insanity because you spent all day doing it. I made my statement about it. It's absolutely not about pegging. It's not about a used condom. Get your minds out of the gutter. It's just a little innocent song about the innocence of your partner and temptation. That's what the song is about, you know, and it's, but no one wants to hear from me. And we even when I made the, uh, I tried to correct it. They're like, nope, we know what it really is. We're saying what the truth. And so it's like, it's just useless. Social media is becoming, it's eating itself now anyway, you know, which is interesting to see. Yeah, it's funny. I, I tweeted today. I was like, send the weirdest possible questions for Mark McGrath. And I got a lot of halo in my, in my responses. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then like you always get the sugar gay things because of that wonderful sugar gay video that you know, 25 years ago, I was walking out of a bar with the, uh, with, with a bunch of uh, a bunch of my gay friends, you know. And it was a night when Madonna was there, and she has a bunch of uh, gay friends as well. And there wasn't really even, like, paparazzi back then. There were just people that followed Madonna around because she was the biggest star in the world. And I was walking outside, and there was the vitriol and the homophobic statements that were coming out of everybody. It just shocked me. Like, you know, and I was just like, God dang, that's horrible. It was 2 in the morning, and I was just drunk enough when someone inserted Sugar Gay for me to, like, get upset. Because I just had it. I always stick up for my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. I always have. You know, I don't get it. I'm not about it. And I just, it just fucking pissed, excuse me, it just pissed me off right there. And, um... That was it. And, and of course, you know, 25 years later, that's still something that exists. But if people really knew what was behind that, I think they'd be a little little less uh, quick to throw around certain, you know, terminology that, you know, is still offensive to people. Because, you know, people aren't calling me sugar gay in a positive way. You know yeah. what I mean? So to me, just when you think about what you're doing, it's kind of weird. But it is what it is. I, act, I reacted like a total moron, the drunken moron that I was. And I did pick the smallest guy in there. Now, people say the guy was 12 years old. Like I was in the bar that night. You know, he had the best ID in the world that the guy's 30 years old. But uh, look, I was 24 back then. You know, So that's kind of fun. That's kind of not fun. It's an interesting thing to kind of like, 
constantly hear about her bat down. But look, I reacted like a moron. Make fun of me for the things I said, but just you know, watch the words sometimes because words still hurt in this day and age. One of the other things I got for you a lot is that it is the 20th anniversary of Scooby Doo, so people want to know what it was like to uh, play Spooky Island. <laughs> Ash, it was the craziest thing ever because we filmed that movie on an island off the Gold Coast of Australia called Moreton Island. It's about 30 miles off the Gold Coast. Um, and we got out there on a shuttle, on a boat. It just took us out there and it dropped us off on the pier of Spooky Island. Meaning we lived on the set of Spooky Island with all the extras and all the cast for five insane party-fueled days. It was unbelievable. Australians know how to get down and party. They are, they are, you know, they are, they just have stamina. They can party. And man, we were so, we crawled off that island back onto that boat. I mean, literally. <laughs> we didn't see much of the cast, but all the extras that were around us, man, were just insane. And I love Scooby Doo because, like, that cartoon, I grew up in the 70s when it came out. Like, that was just our, that was our, that was our go to. We love Scooby Doo. So to be part of that movie, to spend five insane days and nights on Moreton Island on the set of Scooby Doo, we actually slept in the hotel that was part of the movie. We never got out of the spooky island vibe. And I think that's what they were trying to perpetuate because at the end, we all had bloodshot eyes. We were all like zombies <laughs> dragging out of there. So it was almost method acting by day two, but it was such a credible, fun experience. And, you know, it's something I got to show my kids. It's the first thing they ever reacted to because they love Scooby Doo and their daddies in this, you know, the movie. So that was really, really fun to do. And the cast was great. They were all wonderful. Um, you know, Freddie, Matthew, um, Sarah Michelle. You know, it's really sweet people. So a lot, really, really a fun experience. Oh, and Sarah Michelle and Freddie are married. I love it. <laughs> I know, right? Right? They were just, they were, I think they were just going out then. But uh, yeah. obviously it was the Shakespearean love for them both. So very, both very sweet and very, very kind and generous to us on the set. Um, another question I got for you is, does Mark still have any logos or merch with Sugar Ray's original name, Shrinky Dinks? And does he ever miss that name for the band? Uh, the Shrinky Dinks, I, 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 look, it's a pretty lame name, let's be honest, you know. Um, we don't have any lawsuit, merch left right? over. Well, yeah, yeah, here's the thing. We didn't really, we didn't, we wouldn't, we'd still be the Shrinky Dinks today if once we got signed to Atlantic Records, um, Mattel said, oh, that's great. You're the Shrinky Dinks. Here's a year licensing lease. It's a million dollars a year. And we get 25% of whatever you make forever in perpetuity. And we're like, oh. I think we'll call our 12 fans and let them know we're changing our name. This is before the first record even came out, which didn't have much success, as you know, Ash. So it was easy to change the name because it was kind of forced, our hand was forced upon us. And I just, I'm a huge sports fan. And Sugar Ray was my first sports memory, the 1976 Boxing Olympics in Montreal. And Sugar Ray just, he was just the, the MVP of that entire Olympics. So I somehow conned the band into saying, Sugar Ray's a piece of Americana. It's not even sports. And so they went for it. So no Shrinky Dinks merchandise. We only made one batch of that. Um, and we went on the tour with Corn, believe it or not. Corn and Lords of Brooklyn in 95. So um, actually, no, we never, that was Sugar Ray. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm debunking my own story. There is no Shrinky Dinks merchandise. There's stickers. We, we ripped off the Burger King logo and put Shrinky Dinks in there. So <laughs> those are collector's items, if you will, to about five people. <laughs> <laughs> and then a little bit of family lore from Alicia Lutz. Extremely personal question. Did Mark McGrath go to prom in Connecticut with Jackie Pileski? This is a family tale that I doubt is true, but my family has been telling it my entire life. <laughs> Poor Jackie Pileski. You know, we had a profound love affair for about four years and um, she broke up with me. You know, Jackie, you broke my heart. No, it's not true. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I, went to, I went to prom in Orange County, Newport Beach, California, though I was born in Connecticut. So there could be some like, you know, weird validation with that. He was born in Hartford, you know, and so, no, Jackie, I do not know you. Uh, but I love, you know, why let the truth get in the way of a good story? I always That's say, true. I hear a lot of stories like this, getting back to the rumors, you know, Ash, there are a lot of rumors that are just rumors in families, like that I did this, I went here, and I know this, you're on my cousin's soccer team. So sometimes I don't even like debunking them because I don't want to make the person feel like a liar or bad. You know, I, I feel bad and I, I, I'm actually honored they feel like I was worthy enough at one time to perpetuate a rumor like that. So I just say, yep, it's all true. So I went to, I went to prom with like 55 different people. <laughs> I'm going to put you in my family lore. 
I'd be honored, Ash. We're best Mark, friends. So that's Mark McGrath is my best friend. So, but that's actually well, true. That's true. So, you know, you got to make up a better one than that. Yeah, I do. Um, I'll think of one. Um, and we were, <laughs> we were talking about going to your concerts and how you love performing. And just for people who might want to see you, you perform all the time with a bunch of other iconic kind of 90s, early 2000s artists. What do you have on the forefront? Yeah, there's a lot. You can go to uh, SugarA.com or MarkMcGrath.com. It's both one and the same. Or I'm kind of, you know, pretty busy on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And I try to promote as many shows as I can. I do a lot of private shows. Ash. There's a lot of corporate shows and private shows. Like I'll get together with um, Richard Marks and um, uh, Tone Loke. And we'll do these like private shows where they have us play. And we come in and play with the band that they provide. And we do our songs. I've been fortunate enough to be in that sort of circuit too. But the, pub the public shows are obviously on our internet. So check it out. I mean, our website. So check it out. You know, I I've had the, the, the pleasure of being part of the I Love the 90s tour, which is Vanilla Ice, Tone Loke, Color Me Bad, Coolio, Rob Bass, uh, all these wonderful artists I'm huge fans of. So that's always fun. I do the Pop 2000 tour, which has got Chris Kirkpatrick from NSYNC. It's got Ryan Cabrera. It's got O-Town and LFO, which is really fun. You know, just celebrating all the hits, kind of what we talked about earlier, Ash. It's people there that understand why we're there to celebrate the hits, like revel in the nostalgia, not run away from it, embrace the nostalgia. Um, and I'm also in a band called Ezra Ray Hart, which is comprised of uh, Kevin Griffin from Better Than Ezra. He's the Ezra part. Uh, I'm Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. I'm the Ray part. And Emerson Hart, he's the Hart part from Tonic. So we play all the great music from uh, Better Than Ezra, Sugar Ray, and Tonic on one stage, all of us together, one band. No one leaves the stage. And we play a lot of 90s hits as well. So you can see I really celebrate 90s culture, and I'm glad that it's celebrated back towards me. Uh, I feel honored to have been uh, to be a part of so many wonderful projects. And I think the 90s now are, are, are bigger than they've ever been certain mm -hmm. nostalgia tips so i'm uh, i'm trying to work as much as i can because i'm grateful for it all i've decided what my rumor is i want to start a rumor that mark mcgrath has agreed to officiate my wedding listen i officiated <laughs> kevin babona and amy from the interrupters wedding you know the band the interrupters yeah yeah i know you don't no i don't yeah. <laughs> well, they opened last year for Green Day, Weezer, and Fall Out Boy on that big stadium tour. And right now they're on tour with Flogging Molly. They're just an incredible ska. They're like the fourth generation of the ska bands, and they're the leaders of it, and they're incredible. So I officiated their wedding, Ash. So again, this might be a real rumor. Now, are you getting married is the question. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say, so then you can say I did officiate your fake wedding. So there you go. Yeah. That's a good rumor. Or he was going That's to, good. and the wedding fell apart. And <laughs> or you could say I, I broke up your wedding because we got together, you know. Yes, and then, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, that's yes. That, this is getting... that is a scandalous, juicy rumor that I'm gonna have trouble explaining in my house too. Yeah. So now both of us have a problem and an unsubstantiated rumor. I'm gonna send that to do moi right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh man, I, I love talking to you. You're always so motivational. I love your robe talks. I also love that time you broke up with somebody for on cameo or something. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, Ash, another misdirect. Is that another a misdirect? thing? What's well, another thing I go viral for that's not even the reason, but you can't even explain it and why let the truth get in the way of the good story. You know, when I started cameo a couple of years ago. Um, Cameo is a service, and anybody, in case a few people don't know, is where people can call up uh, celebrities, quote unquote, um, and have them, you know, wish you a happy birthday, wish you, uh, you know, congratulations on a wedding, whatever, whatever it is. It, your, your wish is their command if it's reasonable to the to the person you're asking. And I was just starting, and I was trying to get some, you know, some 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 followers, some some action going in the Cameo world. Um, and someone asked me to break up with their uh, boyfriend during, uh, in it, 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 he was a grad student and he had to get his, um, his dissertation done and she wanted to let him down er, uh, easy, but didn't want to affect his dissertation, all this weird stuff. I knew it was a joke right away. Cause how many grad school students are fans of Sugar Ray? Zero, right? They like, they like Bon Ivar or whatever the hell his name is and Iron and Wine and those bands. So I saw through it right away. But what I did ask is I delivered what they wanted very straightforward. You know, I did it with a straight face, like, hey, man, best of luck, and I hope maybe someday. And I was, like, doing it. It was, like, four minutes into it, you know, and that's a long cameo. 
I go, listen, maybe someday we can all meet at Sugar Ray Show and high five backstage. I thought that was a sure tip that it wasn't real. So I sent the cameo and I go, look, the four friends will laugh at me and whatever. I, I, I made a couple bucks and I'm going out with my life. Three weeks later, I'm looking at Twitter and I'm trending number one on Twitter. <laughs> and at the bottom, it says, it says cameo. And I go, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Someone goes, yeah, dude, there's that cameo you made about the breakup is, is trending. I, I forgot about the breakup. I don't know what they were talking about. I go, they can't be right. So then I saw the cam the video. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, oh, man, I was kidding. And then half the people said, oh, my God, Mark, you're so sweet. That was so wonderful of you. And the other half were like, oh, what an idiot, man. They got over on him. Billy Bush is calling me from entertainment or inside or wherever he was at the time going like, hey, Mark, get on. will you come on and talk about the breakup and all that? And it was just so weird. And I was in a position where like, I didn't want to disappoint the people who thought it was very sweet, but I didn't want people to think that I thought it was real. It was so bizarre. And then that went viral around the world. But what it did do was it elevated my cameo position. So the very thing I was trying to do with it, it actually happened in the most misdirect, weird way again. So Ash, what I'm trying to tell you is that all my viral sensations, if you will, are not really what you're seeing. And I think the irony is that's what viral videos are in the first place. Yeah. Boom. You know what I'm two, saying? Two things is your cameo must have like the best types of strange requests now. And I really wonder what it's like to wake up and see your name trending before you click on it and being like, what could this be? <laughs> It's horrifying because the reason why I've trended in the past have been not why the, you know what I mean? They're not re reasons you celebrate, you know what I'm saying? Because either people don't, people, and most in general, if you're trending and you're someone like me, they, it's because they're, they're getting over on you. Not like, hey, it's Mark McGrath's birthday. You know, no one cares about that. You know, it'd be like, oh, look at Mark, was an idiot here, or he did that over there, you know, which is, I mean, some of it is real, I get it, but uh, a lot of it is a little, little bit of a misdirect, but you know what I mean? This is showbiz, baby. You know, just spell my name right, Ash, you know? You know I about. think you're underestimating the adoration for you. I will say this, Ash, and, and you know, there was a time there where the stink of the 90s was real fresh, the highlights and the frosted tip hairdo, all the memories, all the fashions and trends of the 90s were real smelly to people. They were like, ooh, this is expired. It's like, it was like sour milk to people. And I, being like, you know, a face of the 90s, certainly got a lot of, you know, a kickback from that and well deserved, rightfully so. You know, coming out of the decade, there's always that, oh my God, we can't believe we did that. Now, when a certain generation cycles out of that, now has been a lot of like, oh, we love the 90s. And there has been a lot of more adulation, there has been a lot of, God, you know, like I almost have to, you know, I always like, I guess, you know, I'm self facing all that. Like I'll, I'll say my whole spiel about that and they'll go, no, Mark, we're serious. We just love the music. This is coming from like a, like a band with like neck tattoos and they're all emo and angry and we just love the music. And so I almost have to temper the way I get down and talk to people because uh, there is a sort of adulation and fondness for that music. And, and I'm super grateful for it. It's a really wonderful position to be in. On that note, Mark, always lovely to talk to you. Best friends, BFFs. We are BFFs forever. I hope you have a bitchin' summer, Ash. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you again. And thank you for having me on. You've always been so kind and uh, generous to me, and I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I got to come see you. Please do. Oh, we're playing Flannel Nation August 13th here in San Pedro with Everclear, Candlebox, Soul Asylum, Filter, Fastball, Sponge, Cracker. I mean, it's like the 90s threw up on stage, and it's down wow. there in San Pedro all multi-platinum bands. And that is a show where everybody you see, you'll know every song because all these bands support the energy and why you're there. I played with all of them, so I can't wait to get back there. August 13th in San Pedro. Ash, I'm telling you and a friend to be my special guest. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Yes, absolutely. That would be amazing. I'll yeah, shoot, you, shoot you a little PME. All right. <laughs>